Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Just this past year, archaeologists have found some incredible things. From an entire lost city with no name yet, to a vanishing hand under a slab of rock, let's look at some mysteries of incredible ancient civilizations. Ruins of a Roman City In 2023, Archaeologists announced the discovery of a lost city from the Roman era. The mysterious city, which currently has no name, is believed to be the oldest ever found in Spain. Historians are drooling over what secrets it might unlock about the Romans. 2,000 years ago, Spain's Iberian Peninsula was a violent place. Although it was technically under control of the Roman Republic, there were still pockets of defiance. People had been living on the peninsula for thousands of years before the Romans showed up, and the indigenous population was not particularly pleased about being subjugated. One of the greatest conflicts was the Sertorian War between the Romans and the rebels, or the local people. In 70 BC, the war saw the complete destruction of this newly discovered city. It was so effectively destroyed that it disappeared from the history books. But it hasn't completely disappeared from the face of the earth. According to researchers at the University of Zaragoza, they uncovered the central town square of the city, but they haven't fully excavated the city itself, nor do they know its exact size. All they know is the plaza is ancient and huge, predating other plazas found in the area by over a century. What makes the discovery so fascinating is its age. Researchers believe it might be an example of a transition city. It might have been a city taken over by the Romans and gradually turned into a traditional Roman city, complete with a plaza and temples and all that came with being a Roman metropolis. Its deeper history and its connection to the people who came before the Romans are yet to be discovered. India's Serial Killer Cult What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about ancient Indian civilizations? Maybe you're picturing the Indus Valley civilization that ruled in the earliest days of civilized humanity. Or maybe you're more interested in the Mughals and how they shaped Indian customs. But have you heard about the Thuggy, India's obscure serial killer cult? Starting in the 13th century, India began breeding assassins. For 700 years, one of the finest mafias the world has ever seen operated across the Indian subcontinent. They weren't necessarily a civilization, but a subgroup of the larger Indian culture. They were what you might call the embodiment of the darkest side of Hinduism. The Thuggi were the assassins, yes, but they were also fanatically religious. They often carried out ritualistic assassinations in the name of the Hindu goddess Kali. You might remember the chant Kali Ma, Kali Ma from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. That chant in full is Kali Ma Shakti Dei. It means, Mother Kali, give me power. They got the idea from the Thuggy cult. The Thuggy as a group were savage. They would join caravans of travelers and then slay them in the night by strangling them. Then they would rob their victims and bury them where they would never be found. This required a massive amount of teamwork and coordinated cooperation. The first mention of them as an organized group comes from 1356. They were mentioned only as thieves thieves who could trace their origin to the original seven tribes of Islam. But let me get back to Kali for a second. Who was this goddess and why was she so important to a band of killers? In Hindu mythology, Kali is the goddess of destruction. The belief among the Thuggi was that by killing and robbing people, they were aiding Kali in her quest for destruction. It was one of the few groups who worshipped a dark god, one they believed lusted for death and required sacrifices. If the Thuggi still exist today, they do so in secret. The last great Thuggi was executed in 1840. His name was Bairam, and he was accused of strangling 931 people. Nowadays, the term Thug comes from Thuggi, used to refer to young hoodlums around the world. And now for number six. But first, it's shout out time. I want to give a huge thank you to Lacob and Jill Mazo Beta Rodriguez for supporting this channel. We wouldn't be here without you guys. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about mysterious ancient civilizations. The Queen of the Night. There is a remarkable artifact on display at the British Museum known as the Burney Relief. It's not very big, but it's not very small either, nearly two feet tall and just over a foot wide. It's a terracotta relief that displays an enchanting naked woman with wings. 
She's surrounded by owls and standing on the backs of two lions. Who this mysterious woman was is quite the mystery. Archaeologists know the terracotta relief was made almost 4,000 years ago. It was crafted during the rule of Hammurabi in ancient Babylon between 1792 and 1750 BC. The woman in the image has been dubbed the Queen of the Night, but nobody knows who she is supposed to represent. She had originally been painted in bright colors, but those colors have faded over the years. Most historians agree she was a goddess, but which one? The image is honestly so striking, she's become something of a mascot for ancient Babylon. Maybe she was a queen, maybe a king's consort. But the best guess that scientists have right now is that she was a representation of the goddess Inanna. Inanna was the Mesopotamian deity of love and war. But the naked woman may have also been a representation of Lilithu, aka Lilith, the first wife of Adam in the Bible. Yes, many of the Bible's stories have their origins in the myths of old Babylon. The relief as an artifact is wildly valuable. Nobody knows exactly where it came from, only that it arrived in London in the 1930s. The British Museum refused to buy the artifact in 1936, but they did end up buying it in 2004 for 1.9 million. A new species of human A new human species has been given the name Homo bodoensis. Its discovery has shocked the scientific community. The truth of this mysterious ancestor, believed to be directly related to modern humans, could change history. The species was alive and well in Africa half a million years ago. Its skull was discovered in a valley in Ethiopia. Homo bodoensis lived at a time when Homo sapiens first arrived in Africa, and while the first Neanderthals were wandering around in Europe. It's an era anthropologists describe as, and this isn't very scientific, the muddle in the middle. It was the time of the missing link, an epoch that scientists understand very little about. Intelligent humans evolved 500,000 years ago, branched into multiple species that were likely each as intelligent as the other, but scientists doesn't have an answer for why. It was the most important time in human evolution and is arguably the least understood. Finding a new species from such a controversial era is a big deal. Unfortunately, though, I don't have any additional information to tell you right now. It's a very new discovery based on little more than an ancient skull. Could this early human have belonged to the sophisticated civilization? How many early human species were there? And did they fight with one another? Was there war? These are the important questions discoveries like this bring scientists one step closer to answering. Strange Adventures of an Archaeologist Life as an archaeologist isn't as boring as you might think. It isn't all picking through rubble in search of artifacts or maintaining ancient sites. Dr. Hamoudi Kaleli with the Israel Antiquities Authority has had some wild adventures as an archaeologist. One of his weirdest adventures involves a vanishing corpse that to this day he has never been able to explain. The good doctor has been at the forefront of his field since the 1980s. When he was just a young man, he was sent to study the Nabataean civilization at the ancient city of Halutza, near Be'er Shiva. For a bit of background, the Nabataean civilization was a hugely powerful group of people who ruled the deserts of Arabia over 2,000 years ago. Their main city was Petra in modern Jordan, but they had far more settlements spread across the sands of the Middle East. They grew rich from trading in exotic commodities like frankincense and myrrh. They were also obliterated by the Romans around the 1st century AD, which saw their culture lost to time. So let's get back to Dr. Kaleli. He was excavating a mausoleum within the ancient city when he came across some stone slabs six feet beneath the ground. Once he revealed the slabs, an awful stench punched him in the face. It was a foul odor rising from the dirt that stank like death. The other archaeologist he was with told him the death odor was pretty normal for Nabataean sites, but most archaeologists didn't talk about it. What happened next was crazy. Dr. Kaleli lifted the stone slab and came upon a human hand. It was obviously a fresh body, judging by the stink. But what was it doing six feet under an archaeological site? The archaeologists did not dig any further. They reported the discovery of the body to police. When the forensic team arrived the next day to extract the corpse from the pit, it was gone. Everybody was dumbfounded because nobody had disturbed the site. 
Dr. Kaleli and his colleagues had seen the body with their own eyes and smelled its rot, so it had definitely been there. But between sunset and sunrise, the corpse disappeared into thin air. That was four decades ago, and Dr. Kaleli still doesn't know what happened. As a side note, I should mention Dr. Kaleli has another crazy story about encountering a phantom at the Tomb of David in 2012. But that's a story for another day. Remember to check out all these recent videos so you don't miss out on these incredible stories. The Kingdom of the Suebi When the Roman Empire fell to pieces in the 5th century, the Kingdom of the Suebi rose in the chaos that engulfed Portugal. It was a kingdom of Germanic people living in Portugal that most Portuguese people have never even heard of. Almost nothing is known about how the Germanic tribe of Suebi came to dominate Iberia. It's believed they crossed the Rhine in December 406 AD. They quickly established themselves as the dominant power. Then, as Rome started dying, they were one of the first to completely cut themselves off from the Roman system. They prospered greatly for a little over 100 years. Then, when the Visigoths showed up around 585 AD, the Suebi were defeated and disappeared. The really exciting part of this ancient culture is just trying to track their journey from the northern reaches of Germany to the coast of Portugal. Ancient historian Hydatius wrote that when the Suebi traveled into Hispania, they entered a frenzy of plunder and destruction. These were the same Germanic people that Rome had continuously failed to conquer and who had ultimately been their downfall. The Suebi supposedly caused such destruction on their way to Portugal that it created a famine. Locals resorted to cannibalism because they had nothing to eat. Little of their influence remains today, but it's not totally gone. The village of Suevos in Galicia is one of the few places whose name can be traced back to the kingdom of the Suebi. Aelia Capitolina Of course you've heard of Rome and you've heard of Jerusalem, but what do you know about Aelia Capitolina? For 500 years, it replaced Jerusalem as a Roman city. Within its walls was a unique culture of foreigners and Roman occupiers. It lasted longer than the United States has been a country so far, so you can surely imagine that it developed as a distinct sort of civilization. The formation of Aelia Capitolina goes all the way back to the year 70. It was a bad year for the Jews living in Jerusalem. They were already under the sum of Rome. A couple years earlier, a Roman prefect, Gessius Florus, had demanded the Roman rulers receive a portion of the offerings at the Second Temple. The Jews were so angry that they revolted, but it did not end well for them. Emperor Nero sent legendary general Vespasian to deal with the rebels. Vespasian was not a man to do things half-heartedly. He utterly destroyed Galilee and Judea. Then his son Titus, in the year 70, laid siege to Jerusalem. The holy city fell, the second temple was obliterated, and the Jewish people suffered great misery. Sixty-five years later, from the ruins of Jerusalem rose Aelia Capitolina. It was named in honor of Emperor Hadrian, a combination of his family name and the gods Jupiter, Minerva, and Juno. Although the city was built on Jerusalem, it was 100% Roman. There was a temple to Jupiter where once there had been a temple to God. Roman deities stood as stone statues to look down on the residents of the city. The Romans completely disregarded everything the Jews held sacred in their Old Testament. And of course, they disregarded the rising religion known as Christianity. Jews weren't even allowed in the city. For five long centuries, Jerusalem was a distant memory. The city was largely occupied by the Roman military and foreigners from the farthest reaches of the empire. Jews remained outside Jerusalem until about the 7th century. Christians were exempt starting in the 4th century thanks to the conversion of Roman Emperor Constantine. It was also Constantine who helped change the name back to Jerusalem. Las Teotihuacan In the very heart of Mexico City, the last remnants of an ancient village were recently uncovered. The village dates to around 1500 years ago. It was part of the larger Teotihuacan civilization. Researchers uncovered human burials and broken bits of ceramic. The village likely belonged to a suburban group of craftsmen and artisans. Juan Carlos Campos Varela from Mexico's National Institute of History and Anthropology called the discovery surprising. 
He said the remains of this small village prove that there was already a permanent population at the edge of Lake Texcoco long before the birth of Mexico City. This was centuries before the Aztec established their great city of Tenochtitlan. Whatever you do, don't mix up the civilization of Teotihuacan with the Aztec. These were two completely different groups of people who happened to live in central Mexico, but at vastly different times. 2,000 years ago, Teotihuacan flourished as what was likely the biggest city in the Americas. It continued to prosper until about 650 AD when it abruptly vanished. Researchers always assumed there was only one large city, but now they've been finding satellite cities, settlements, villages in the nearby area. The one they just found in Mexico City is about 25 miles from Teotihuacan. It likely supported the main city through farming and fishing. However, it too was deserted in 650. Nobody has any clue why. What archaeologists do know is that when the Aztec found the abandoned Teotihuacan, they thought it was a city built by gods. It was just as mysterious to the Aztec as it is to us today. Thanks for watching. Which of these ancient kingdoms is your favorite? Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Long Yu Caves A group of farmers in China's Zhejiang province received the surprise of a lifetime in 1992 when they drained several small ponds in their village and discovered some enormous caves. It turned out to be an ancient underground world that nobody knew existed. All signs point toward the caves being carved out on purpose by some ancient civilization. But the question is, who were they? So far, 36 grottos have been discovered, including five enormous caverns, in total covering 30,000 square meters. The curious thing is that none of them are connected. They were carved into solid siltstone, with pillars evenly distributed throughout to support the ceiling and walls. Every stone column and wall is uniformly decorated with chisel marks, creating parallel lines. The marks make everything look like a pattern which would have taken a very long time, especially in the dark. There are also stone carvings of animals like horses, fish, and birds. The structures collect rainwater runoff from ground level and are equipped with sophisticated drainage systems for managing excess water. Based on the sheer size of the caves, scientists estimate that it would have taken 1,000 people working day and night for six years to complete. It probably took much longer than that, but so far there is no evidence of tools or construction methods. The large scale of the caves and the architectural design and attention to detail indicate that they were made by a very advanced society. But ever since their discovery, archaeologists, scientists, and historians have been unable to determine who built the Long Yu Caves, why they were built, and what they were for. The only known historical record mentioning the caves is a 17th century poem, which doesn't really reveal much. Clay pots discovered on the cavern's floors were dated to sometime between 206 BC and 23 AD, suggesting that the caves are at least 2,000 years old. Perhaps the caves were tombs, storage facilities of some kind, barracks for soldiers, or perhaps it was used for some type of mining. Only one of these caves is open to tourists so far, and despite years of research, the civilization responsible remains unexplained. Aksumite Empire Considered one of the least documented civilizations of the ancient world, the Aksumite Empire was an African kingdom that spanned modern-day Eritrea and northern Ethiopia, as well as parts of Djibouti, Somalia, and Somaliland. It rose to power around 80 AD and lasted for many centuries, meeting its downfall in 825. The kingdom of Aksum was a major player along a commercial trade route between the Roman Empire and ancient India. It had its own currency for trading and participated in the politics of kingdoms across the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula. Aksum was the first sub-Saharan empire to mint its own coins and adopt Christianity, but researchers know very little else about it. Outside of Egypt and Sudan, it's the earliest complex society or major civilization in Africa, archaeologist Michael Harrower told The New Scientist. Aksum stopped producing coins in the early 7th century. Meanwhile, residents were forced inland for safety, where they sought refuge from some sort of upheaval on higher ground. The capital was abandoned and resettled at a yet unknown location. One theory suggests that the Aksum Empire became economically isolated as other civilizations dominated the Red Sea, naturally leading to its decline. 
On the other hand, legend holds that a Jewish queen named Yodit ordered the burning of Aksum's Christian churches around 960, but several modern historians doubt that she ever even existed. Another hypothesis suggests that a pagan queen named Bani al-Hamwiya from a rivaling tribe ended Aksumite power. Climate change is also cited as a possible triggering factor for the kingdom of Aksum's collapse. During the first century, increased rains vastly improved the region's food supply and lengthened the annual growing season. But food production had to support a large population, and it's possible that the land simply could not endure the intensity of cultivation that the culture required, and that soil erosion ultimately led to the Aksumite Empire's downfall. In late 2019, archaeologists announced the discovery of Beta Samati, a lost Aksum city located between its capital, also named Aksum, and the Red Sea, thanks to locals tipping them off about the buried site, which sits over 10 feet below ground. Experts hope that the settlement will help them learn more about the enigmatic empire and its decline, which began during the mid-6th century. The Kukuteni Tripilians The Neolithic Kukuteni Tripilian culture, also known as the Tripoli culture, existed in what is now Eastern Europe, encompassing parts of modern-day Moldova, Ukraine, and Russia. It rose to prominence around 5,500 BC and lasted until 2,750 BC. The civilization's settlements were small and dense. Sometime between 4,000 and 3,500 BC, the Kukuteni Tripilia civilization built Neolithic Europe's largest settlements, with populations numbering between 20,000 and 46,000 people. Evidence shows that the culture had a habit of destroying its settlements every 60 to 80 years by burning them down, for reasons that scientists still don't understand. Oftentimes, they built new settlements on top of the burned-down remains of past ones. For example, the Poduri site in Romania bears evidence of 13 habitation levels throughout its existence. The Kukuteni Tripilians also left behind no signs of a written language. Between this and the seemingly ritual burning of their cities, experts have very little to work with in terms of learning about the culture. The few clues left behind include clay totems, copper tools, and spiritual treasures. Rediscovered during the late 19th century, evidence of the civilization shows that Neolithic Eastern Europe played a bigger role in human advancement than it was previously credited for, but the lingering question of what and how it contributed remain. Ancestral Puebloans A group of Native Americans called the Anasazi, now referred to as the Ancestral Puebloans, once lived in an area of the U.S. that is famously known today as the Four Corners. Their network of hundreds of communities spanned across modern-day southeastern Utah, northeastern Arizona, northwestern New Mexico, and southwestern Colorado. The ancestral Puebloans possessed an advanced knowledge of the skies and incorporated the celestial sciences into their diverse architecture. They are best known for their famous cliff dwellings, which were primarily used for defensive purposes. Built between 900 and 1350 AD, these multi-story homes were incorporated into tall, steep mesas and canyon walls like large apartment complexes. Some of these structures can still be seen today in places like the Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico and Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. The ancestral Puebloans also built small pit houses out of earth and stone, as well as huge complexes of hundreds of rooms known as Great Houses. Additionally, they were well known for their pottery, which was generally gray in color. They are also well known for their kivas, a circular space used for ceremonial purposes. During the 12th and 13th centuries, they left their homes, and historians have not figured out why. Researchers believe that climate change, such as prolonged drought, topsoil erosion, deforestation, and other environmental factors may have triggered the decision to migrate elsewhere. But they can't say with certainty that this was the case. They can only speculate based on the available evidence. The Mycenaeans the Mycenaeans were immigrants who arrived in the Aegean region around 2000 BC. While their origins are a bit murky, they subsequently conquered the Minoans after living alongside them and trading with them for some time. The Minoans and the Mycenaeans were the first literate societies in Europe and greatly influenced the classical Greeks. The Mycenaeans took over the Minoan area and were more militaristic and austere than they were. They became the dominant civilization in the area, building palace fortresses and tombs, large walls and gates. They frequently terrorized and raided other societies like the Hittites and the Egyptians. Through their plundering, they became extremely wealthy, and the civilization flourished between 1600 and 1200 BC. 
There were over 100 centers spread throughout Greece and the Mediterranean, but historians still don't know how they were organized, how they communicated, and what the relationship was between all of the different palaces and their populations. Then suddenly, the civilization began to decline. Around 1230 BC, people began leaving the region in droves. Some historians say that we may never know why the Mycenaeans disappeared. There are numerous theories, including the realistic possibility that the society's violence against others finally caught up with them. Natural disasters, possibly including an earthquake and or volcanic eruption, may have also caused their decline. By 1100 BC, most majestic sites had been reduced to villages, but their legacy remains. The Rapa Nui Hundreds of years ago, a small group of Polynesians left their homeland for unknown reasons and rowed their vessels through the Pacific Ocean. They eventually settled on a remote island known today as Easter Island, located roughly 2,182 miles off the modern-day Chilean coast. Found uninhabited, this small 63-square-mile island boasted lush greenery and rolling hills. The settlers named it Rapa Nui. There, they built massive monolithic structures called Moai. Also known as the Easter Island Heads, some of these mysterious sculptures still stand today. The more archaeologists and researchers learn, the more intriguing Easter Island becomes. The immense stone figures are a testament to the society's artistry and engineering. Scientists can seem to agree on exactly when the Rapa Nui people arrived on the island. It was previously believed that they came between 700 and 800 AD, but a radiocarbon analysis shows that they may have arrived as late as 1200. Others think that the Rapa Nui came to the island much sooner, perhaps as early as 300 AD. Some question how they were able to plot their course to get to the island in the first place. Researchers also struggle to understand why the civilization collapsed. Perhaps they ran out of food. It looks like at some point deforestation and agriculture caused palm trees and grass to dwindle, leaving behind eroded, nutrient-deprived soil that became practically impossible to cultivate. The island was practically barren by the time the Dutch arrived in 1722. One theory holds that the Rapa Nui civilization consisted of several tribes throughout the island, and that these factions began warring against one another when food became scarce and the threat of starvation loomed. Another hypothesis, based on findings indicating that the Rapa Nui may have arrived around 1200, suggests that the environmental destruction they suffered from happened extremely fast. Rat bones found at an ancient settlement site point toward the possibility that this invasive species contributed to the society's swift downfall. Archaeologist Terry Hunt does not believe that humans could have destroyed the island's forest so quickly on their own, and that the rodents fed on the once abundant plant life until there was practically nothing left. The San Xing Dui During the Bronze Age, a little-known culture called the San Xing Dui thrived in what is now China's Sichuan province. The only known site connected to the civilization turned up dozens of artifacts dating back to the 12th and 11th centuries BC, although evidence shows that a walled city existed at the site as far back as 1600 BC. Built along the banks of the Yazi River, the city and its walls were surrounded by large canals measuring between 66 and 82 feet wide and 6.6 .6 to 10 feet deep, which were used for navigation, defense, and flood control. Sangshuing Dui was divided into residential, industrial, and religious districts. A farmer discovered the first known evidence of the ancient culture in 1929, when he unearthed a cache of jade artifacts while digging a well. Many of the objects, therefore, ended up in the possession of private collectors. Meanwhile, Chinese archaeologists scoured the area for further evidence of the civilization, and finally hit the pay dirt in 1986, when they found sacrificial pits filled with bronze, jade, and pottery items. The items were broken and burned before being buried, indicating that they were ritually placed in the ground sometime between 3,000 and 5,000 years ago, when the culture mysteriously vanished from the site. Nobody really knows exactly who the Sang Shuing Dui really were, despite the handful of evidence they left behind. They abandoned their settlement sometime between 2,800 and 3,000 years ago, and possibly moved to the nearby ancient city of Jinsha. Researchers aren't sure why they fled. One prevailing theory suggests that the ancient people encountered an earthquake or a landslide, which redirected the Minjiang River, cutting them off from their freshwater supply and forcing them to relocate elsewhere. The Etruscans The Etruscans left behind the first identifiable evidence of their civilization around 900 BC in what is now Tuscany in modern-day Italy, a region once called Eritrea. 
They are considered one of the most advanced societies to develop outside of ancient Greece, yet scientists know very little about their origins. The earliest known examples of Etruscan writing date back to around 700 BC. Today's scholars only partially understand the Etruscan language, as the culture's texts did not survive into modern times. For this reason, researchers rely heavily on later writings from Greek and Roman sources, which carry a disapproving bias against the Etruscans and do not necessarily reflect the culture accurately. For example, archaeological evidence suggests that they were indigenous to Eritrea, but the Greeks wrote that the Etruscans stemmed from the indigenous Pelasgian population of Greece, something which modern experts doubt heavily. Etruscologist Dominique Briquel argued that the Greeks made this assertion based on witnessing trade between the Etruscans and Pelasgians and similarities between some of the two societies' traditions that likely resulted from cultural exchange rather than migration. Additionally, Briquel claimed that the Greeks had political motivations for fabricating the Etruscans' history. The Etruscans began assimilating into Roman society sometime during the 4th century BC, following the Roman-Etruscan Wars. In 90 BC, they were granted Roman citizenship, and their territory was fully incorporated into the Roman Empire in 27 BC. Much of the Etruscan culture was likely lost throughout this transition, and even DNA studies have failed to definitely determine exactly where the civilization came from. The Bell Beaker Culture The Bell Beaker Culture arose around 2800 BC and is named for its inverted bell-shaped drinking vessels which came into use at the very beginning of the European Bronze Age. These unique-looking cups became all the rage across Europe at the time, leading to a debate among modern experts. Whether the people who used the bell beakers were a single culture that migrated across Europe, or the vessels were used across various cultures. It's the pot versus people argument, which is one of the longest-running questions in archaeology. The sheer variety of bell beaker artifacts makes it difficult to trace them to one singular culture or place of origin, leaving today's researchers to refer to the spread of these items simply as the bell beaker phenomenon. Scientists analyzed the genomes of 170 ancient Europeans and compared them to the genomes of other ancient people, as well as modern genomes. They found that skeletons discovered near bell beaker artifacts in modern-day Central Europe and Iberia shared few genetic ties indicating that the culture did not consist of one group of migrating people. On the other hand, ancient remains from Britain point toward the Bell Beaker people being a genetically distinct group that almost entirely replaced the people who occupied the island before they arrived. This suggests that the Beaker people invaded Britain and pushed out the previous population of Neolithic farmers, the ones who built Stonehenge. Today, British people have more DNA from the Beaker people than Neolithic farmers and are barely related to the Neolithic people who built the monument 5,000 years ago. The findings are absolutely sort of mind-blowing, said archaeologist Barry Cunliffe, a professor emeritus at the University of Oxford. They are going to upset people, but that's part of the excitement of it. DNA analysis of 400 prehistoric skeletons, some from after Stonehenge and others born before it was created, demonstrate that the beakers replaced 90% of the people and had fair skin and lighter hair and eyes. They may have destroyed the people who built Stonehenge by bringing the bubonic plague with them to Britain. The spread of ideas and migration and the fact that so many beaker artifacts have been found throughout Europe make these people an enigma. The Vinca The Vinca civilization proves that women have been dressing to impress for at least 7,500 years. That is, according to the Neolithic figurines found at the Plochnik archaeological site in Serbia. Recent excavations at this site, which was once part of Europe's biggest prehistoric civilization called the Vinca, point to an ancient metropolis with a large degree of sophistication and an unusual lust for fashion. The Neolithic settlement is situated in a valley deep in the wilderness of what is today modern Serbia. The figurines discovered here display young women beautifully dressed in miniskirts and short tops, and even wearing bracelets around their arms. The tribe that made these figurines is unknown, but they definitely lived sometime between 5400 and 4700 BC. They practiced art and metallurgy, and they even built a thermal well near their settlement that could be the oldest spa in Europe. According to a local archaeologist, they also produced about 60 different forms of pottery and figures to represent their deities and probably just because they liked art. But how could the tribe be unknown when they were part of the Vinca civilization? 
It's because we know the culture flourished in what is today Bosnia, Romania, Serbia, and Macedonia from 5500 to 4000 BC. The culture was named Vinca after the small village near Belgrade, where archaeologists found eight Neolithic villages. These were all part of the mysterious Vinca culture, one of the oldest civilizations in Europe. But scientists don't actually know the names of the individual tribes, who their leaders were, or even what gods they worshipped. We just know that they really liked fashion. Unknown Kingdom Archaeologists working in Turkey have just discovered a previously unknown people who may have played a major role in the ancient world. They ruled a massive part of what is today Turkey, and if the archaeological evidence is to be believed, they even defeated the notorious King Midas. Remember him? He was said to have the golden touch, where everything turned to gold. Professor James Osborne from the Oriental Institute went on record saying we had no idea about this kingdom. It was completely unknown. But everything changed when a farmer found a strange large stone on his property. He was digging in a nearby canal when he found the stone and noticed it had mysterious writing on it. At the time of his discovery, there were researchers nearby exploring a prehistoric mound site. So he told them about it and they came over to take a look. What they found shocked them to the core. The stone was sticking out of the water and they had to wade into the canal up to their waist to inspect it. The archaeologists recognized the writing on the stone immediately as Luwian, an ancient language used in both the Bronze Age and Iron Age in Turkey. It turned out that the inscription was written by an unknown king named Hartapu, and he was boasting how he had defeated King Midas and the Kingdom of Phrygia. Considering Phrygia and King Midas were quite powerful back in their day, whoever these ancient people were, led by the mysterious King Hartapu, must have been quite fierce. So what happened to these powerful lost people? Why have we never heard of them before? And that, my friends, remains a mystery. The Gladiatrix Little do most people know there was a group of ancient people called the Gladiatrix. They weren't a race of people or the byproduct of a mysterious society. Instead, they were the female equivalent of male Roman gladiators. The gladiatrix, or female gladiators, would battle against each other or wild animals during arena games and celebrations. But don't get too excited just yet, as these ladies of the ring weren't treated quite as well as the female fighters of today. There wasn't even a word in Latin for a gladiatrix. It's a modern term that was made up. The gladiatrix began as more of a derogatory or joking event to entertain the spectators, which were mostly men. In reality, they were considered quite rare. The Roman poet Decimus Junius Juvenalis said that gladiatrix trained using the same methods and weapons as their male counterparts, though no records have been found in any of the gladiator training schools that talk about women. But here's where things get really odd with the gladiatrix. Unlike gladiators who were mostly slaves, Gladiatrix could be women of any class, both high and low. It seems any woman who wanted to fight could be trained and let loose in the arena. This went on until about 200 AD, when Emperor Septimius Severus banned women from the arena, claiming that too many jokes were being made about upper-class women, so no more women were allowed to participate in the games. The Nuragic Civilization The Nuragic Civilization lived on the island of Sardinia in the Mediterranean. But even though we know of their existence, we don't know much about what they did, who they were, or even where they went. Archaeologists have found structures, graves, pieces of art, and figurines, and yet there is a huge gap in the knowledge of the Nuragic. We know that they lived during the Bronze Age and Iron Age, and that their best-known structures left behind were the Nuragi Towers. There are about 7,000 of these towers scattered across Sardinia. Though at the time the civilization was thriving, there may have been up to 30,000 on the island. That's a lot for a limited space. The towers were all circular, each with their own flat rooftop, and the earliest one found dates back to the 18th century BC. What the towers were used for is still up for debate, with some saying they were used as rooftops, and others saying they were used as terraces. They may have even been dwellings or just silos for storing liquids and dry foods. It's hard to say since some of them were up to 90 feet tall. Besides the towers, the Nuragic left behind giant megalithic graves, with each one stuffed with about a dozen bodies and several hundred graves in a single cemetery. Some of these burial chambers go 60 feet underground. 
Scholars believe the Naragic thought that their dead would be transformed into gods when buried so deep underground. But as for what the civilization believed in, nobody really knows. They lived on the island for about 5,000 years and then vanished mysteriously for unknown reasons, just before the Carthaginian conquest of the 6th century BC. The Indus Utopia The Indus civilization thrived for roughly 700 years without having a single war. Archaeologists have referred to this civilization as the first paradise on Earth. They had no inequality, no royalty, no weapons, and apparently no way to defend themselves since it looks like they didn't need to. They also had 54 cities that were governed by educated officials and a prince who was elected to serve for life. These people saw no glory in fighting and may have been the first practitioners of Hinduism. The Indus people lived from between 2600 to 1900 BC, occupying roughly 1,000 settlements in what is today Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. The remains of the civilization were only recently discovered in the 1920s, with all signs pointing to an extremely advanced society and one of the greatest in history. They had a trade network that stretched to the Arabian Sea, and archaeologists have even found artifacts from the Indus civilization in Mesopotamian cities like Akkad and Ur. The biggest Indus cities were Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, and even though they were built thousands of years ago, they were extremely advanced, even by today's standards. They had streets that were properly planned, sewage systems that actually worked, and a huge brick water tank called the Great Bath, which should be considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Indus Valley Civilization even figured out the written word, creating their very own mysterious script that has left archaeologists stumped because they can't decipher it. But sadly, the society fell off the map about 4,000 years ago and nobody knows why. It could be that other civilizations saw their peaceful ways as weakness and destroyed them. But for now, the reasons remain unclear. The Achaemenid Empire At around the time the Assyrians were building their new empire, a group of tribes were settling what is today Iran. These people were breaking away from their old nomadic lifestyles to start cities. The tribes came together and formed what we know of today as the Achaemenid Empire, or the First Persian Empire. It was founded by Cyrus the Great and reached its peak under the rule of Xerxes I, you know, the bad guy from the movie 300. Xerxes conquered almost all of ancient Greece even taking the city of Athens in 480 BC. At that point, the Achaemenid Empire stretched all across the Balkans and as far as the Indus Valley, where the Indus civilization once flourished that I just told you about. One of the reasons the Achaemenid Empire was so impressive is that the world had never seen an empire of such magnitude. It covered an area of about 2.1 million square miles, and amazingly, it came about simply because of the Iranian tribes who settled what became known as Persia in the 7th century BC. Within just 300 years, the tribes had transformed into the greatest empire on Earth. But other than just conquering pretty much everyone, what was the Achaemenid Empire known for? Well, they began to create roads across the world, and they started the first postal system, and they were one of the first people to use an official language across all of their territories. They also developed civil services, they maintained the largest standing army on the planet, and they would become an inspiration to Alexander the Great many years later, when he conquered the Achaemenid Empire in 330 BC. Dilmun Empire The Dilmun civilization was located on the Arabian Peninsula and is significantly less famous than the other big civilizations that sprang up around the same time, such as Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. Today, the ruins of the Dilmun civilization can be found in Bahrain. But what's really interesting about Dilmun is that it was kind of a mythological place in ancient times. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, arguably the first great work of literature ever written, the hero must seek out Utnapishtim to gain immortality, and Utnapishtim hails from Dilmun. Dilmun is mentioned in the myth of Enki and Nehursag as well, with the nation being depicted as an earthly paradise. But Dilmun was by no means mythical. It was a very real civilization that has even been found in records from Sumer and Babylon. The Dilmun people also traded with the Indus Valley people, but tracking down the actual archaeological evidence has been a bit trickier. Dilmun was definitely part of Bahrain, but may have also stretched into Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. 
Excavations in the 1950s revealed an ancient harbor that may have been the capital of Dilmun near the current village of Sar, removing any doubt once and for all that Dilmun was indeed one of the first major civilizations. India's Illuminati There was once a secret order of people in India that many people today have never heard of. This secret cult preceded any evidence of the Illuminati. The group was founded by the great emperor Ashoka around the year 270 BC. Ashoka ruled the Maurya dynasty in India and is considered one of the greatest Indian rulers in history. As far as the legend goes, Ashoka formed the secret society of the Nine Unknown. Nine unknown men were chosen to preserve secret knowledge and prevent it from getting into the hands of the public. Each person was given a powerful book of knowledge to memorize and keep safe. Some claims say that the books contain knowledge of things like time travel, aliens, and other revelations that could spark panic if unleashed to the people. But just whatever happened to these nine unknown men? It's believed that they kept their books of knowledge until such a time when they needed successors. Then each member found another worthy individual and passed on their responsibility, and that has been happening for over 2,000 years. There is absolutely zero evidence of this except hearsay and vague historical records. But that's how the legend goes. The Nok The Nok culture lived in what is today Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the most populous nations in Africa today, and one of the strongest. And this history of strength and perseverance goes back thousands of years. The Nok culture was one of the first in Africa to master ironworking. They left behind amazing relics of artistic value and some pretty impressive terracotta sculptures. However, not much is known about these people or their belief system. According to National Geographic, the Nok culture existed from between 500 BC to 200 AD. They farmed crops, they figured out how to use iron tools, and they mastered the art of sculpting. Up until 1943, this culture had been completely unknown even to the locals. Near the modern town of Nok, archaeologist Bernard found the sculptures of human heads animals, and humanoid figurines with massive triangular-shaped eyes that almost look like aliens. These weird sculptures have been found throughout an area of about 30,000 square miles. Archaeologists have even analyzed the clay used to build the sculptures, determining that all the clay came from a single source that was probably controlled by a central authority. As for ruins, well, not much has been found. The origin of the Nok people is still a mystery as basically nothing except their bizarre sculptures have been found. Hegra Hegra is an ancient city in Saudi Arabia that looks an awful lot like Petra in nearby Jordan. It is an impressive ruin carved into the side of a massive rock in the middle of a barren desert. The ruin was left behind by a civilization known as the Nabataeans. If you haven't heard of these guys before, you're not alone. Even though they were an intriguing civilization that thrived throughout Arabia, there isn't much known about them. They lived in the desert and practiced a nomadic lifestyle before they turned into merchants that controlled the spice trade going through Arabia to places like Egypt and Mesopotamia. These were the people who led camel caravans filled with peppercorn, sugar, and cotton through the desert to be traded to kingdoms in the Mediterranean. The Nabataeans were also the suppliers of things like frankincense and myrrh, which were crucial for religious ceremonies further west. These people prospered in the desert from between 400 BC until 100 AD. Everything was going just fine, until the Roman Empire annexed much of their land and absorbed the Nabataeans. By the time the Roman Empire fell, Nabatea was a distant memory. The Etruscans The ancient Etruscans were a powerful and wealthy civilization that lived in modern-day central and northern Italy. The Etruscan civilization lasted from the 8th century BC to somewhere between the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, but even though they were around for a while, they were considered one of the greatest enigmas of antiquity. They had their own language which has never been properly deciphered, and scientists and historians debated about their origins since they were completely different from others in classical Italy. They learned how to mine metals such as copper and iron, and this gave them an edge that brought huge wealth to the people. They developed strong trading relations and built walled towns high on the hilltops that can still be seen today in Umbria and Tuscany. At their peak, the Etruscans covered a large area of Italy. They had city-states far to the north and south of the country, and early Rome was heavily influenced by their culture. There is also ongoing debate as to how much the Etruscans influenced the Roman civilization. Rome's early kings were believed to be Etruscan. 
Like I mentioned, the Etruscan language was unique to them, and they borrowed heavily from the Greeks in the formation of their alphabet, which, in turn, formed the basis of the one used by the Romans. They were polytheistic just like the Romans and the Greeks, and their artworks, of which a number have survived, focus heavily on their religion. Ultimately, though, the Etruscan civilization fell because of increased threats from all around. The Greek city-states in Sicily and southern Italy weakened the Etruscan influence there. They were thrown out of a number of cities such as Rome, which declared its independence, and Gallic tribes destroyed a number of northern cities. In their stronghold, they resisted the emerging power of the Roman Empire for as long as they could, but eventually surrendered after a prolonged period of fighting. The Noc the Noc is believed to have been the first complex civilization to develop in West Africa and were dominant in regions of modern-day Nigeria between 900 BC and 200 AD. All evidence of the Noc had been lost, though, until a group of tin miners happened to dig up a large collection of terracotta artifacts in 1928. Their terracotta statues and sculptures ranged in all kinds of shapes and sizes and demonstrate extraordinary talent. The source of their clay is still unknown. Since then, we've learned a lot about this forward-thinking civilization from the Iron Age. They had an extremely advanced judicial system where courts were used to settle cases. They believed that crimes attracted curses that could destroy whole families, so it was vital to find the perpetrator to avoid the consequences. They also created intricate life-size terracotta statues, which are thought to have depicted a revered leader or maybe in tribute to higher powers to receive favorable weather and crop yields. In the end, the Nox civilization suddenly disappeared in a short period of time. The lack of records from the time means that we don't really know why this happened, but there have been suggestions that it could have been because the people overexploited the natural resources and soon ran out. Or maybe there could have been an invasion, changing climate, or even a pandemic. Who knows? The Indus Valley Civilization the Indus Valley Civilization existed in modern-day Pakistan and northern India and reached its peak between 2500 and 2000 BC. They were a Bronze Age society that was based around the Indus River and had a number of cities, each of which was meticulously planned, with brick houses, underground drainage systems, and communal structures. Pretty impressive for thousands of years ago, right? Most of what we know about the Indus comes from the excavation of two cities, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, which were home to as many as 60,000 people each. Existing at the same time as the ancient Egyptians, there were a number of similarities in the way that they lived, but the Indus civilizations covered a much larger area, with the central part covering a 930-mile stretch of the river. Interestingly enough, they didn't have one single ruler. Instead, they were a collection of city-states that had their own system of governance and worked in tandem with each other. They were also technologically advanced for the time, with a great understanding of measurements, metallurgy, and construction. A number of artifacts have been found at dig sites that show there was an artistic side to Indus life too, with various sculptures, terracotta statues, gold jewelry, and games having been found. See, they knew how to have fun too. The Kingdom of Kush Focused around the city of Meiro, the Kingdom of Kush originally formed at the end of the Bronze Age and ruled the lands of modern-day Sudan until the 4th century, particularly flourishing from 1069 BC through to the end. In a similar way to the Egyptians, the leaders were buried in pyramid-shaped structures, first at the city of Napata and then in Meiro when the capital moved there in 300 BC. The kingdom shared a border with the Egyptian Empire and had frequent skirmishes with them, even invading Egypt in the 8th century BC, where the Kushite kings were also the pharaohs of the 25th dynasty of Egypt. The Kush region was a vital source of gold for the Egyptians, too, so the two civilizations were intertwined with one another. One of the main reasons we know the Kingdom of Kush existed is because of Egyptian writings that mention them, and in particular, their powerful archers. Ultimately, though, despite the vast power of the Kingdom of Kush, the capital city was invaded by the Aksumites around the year 330, and this led to the fall of the civilization within just 20 years. The Kingdom of Yam Very little is known about the ancient African Kingdom of Yam, apart from a few Egyptian texts from the Old Kingdom. Most information comes from the autobiography of Harkouf, a series of writings that were found buried in a tomb, and detail the experiences of a governor of Upper Egypt during the 6th dynasty, about 4,300 years ago. According to this account, Harkouf traveled south to the Kingdom of Yam a number of times to trade with them, and returned with a variety of gifts for the Egyptian Empire. During one trip, he came back with a group of warriors of Yam, who, according to other texts, assisted the pharaoh in the war against the Asiatic sand-dwellers and impressed all those that they served under. 
Despite knowing that the kingdom existed, it's not clear where this kingdom was based, what they were like, or what happened to them. For all we know, there could be the ruins of another great African civilization just waiting to be found. But for a few mentions in ancient writings, the Kingdom of Yam would have been completely lost to history. The Silla Kingdom Believed to have been found by the Hyokos in 57 BC, Silla was one of the three kingdoms of ancient Korea and brought the country together under the unified Silla dynasty in the year 668. They originally held territory in the central and southern regions of the peninsula and were ruled by the Kim clan for 586 years, the Bak clan for 232 years, and the Sok clan for 172 years. During this almost 1,000-year period, Silla conquered the other two main kingdoms of the time, the Baekchi and Kogoryu, and took control of virtually the entire peninsula before eventually falling apart and having to hand over power in the year 935. The Silla used an advanced system of law and governance based on a ruling monarchy that was held to account by a strong aristocracy. Due to their frequent wars, they had a well-established military with local garrisons stationed in each district. It's rare that a civilization has ruled the lands for almost a millennia, and even more surprising that very few people have ever heard of them. The Yuezi the Yuezi, also known as the Indo-Sith, were a nomadic people who ruled in India and the ancient country Bactria between about 128 BC and 450 AD. The first mention of the Yuezi comes from Chinese records, which say that they started in what is now the Gansu province of northwestern China and began moving westward after their king was killed by the ruler of a competing civilization, the Xiongnu. As they traveled through Sogdenia and Bactria, they fought all of those along the way and ended Greek rule in the region in around 30 BC, before extending south into India and north into Central Asia. They became a powerful force, and it's believed that the missionaries from the Yuezi Empire were instrumental in bringing Buddhism to China. 100 years after their conquest of Bactria, the unified Yuezi state, after extending their borders into the surrounding regions, became the Kushan Empire, which itself lasted into the mid-5th century. The Sangxingdui The Sangxingdui culture was a major Bronze Age civilization in the region of what is now Sichuan in China. They had all but been forgotten until a worker who was repairing a sewage ditch found a series of jade and stone artifacts in 1929. It was only in 1986, though, that researchers realized how important a civilization they were, with the discovery of two large pits of treasures, which contained jades, around 100 elephant tusks, and bronze sculptures that were 8 feet tall. This intricacy of these works proved that the Sangxingdui had a far more advanced technical ability than any other known people in the world at that time. The walled city, with the same name, stood proud on the banks of the Minjiang River. For some reason, though, at some point between 3,000 and 2,800 years ago, the culture moved away from the area, with evidence at a second site called Jinsha near Chengdu suggesting that they had moved there. It had long been a mystery why they would suddenly relocate themselves, but recently answers have come to light. It's now thought that an earthquake in the region may have caused massive changes to the landscape and diverted their main water source. When this happened, they would have had no choice but to move closer to the new river flow and abandon their stronghold. Instead of taking everything with them, they dismantled and buried many of their treasures in the pits that were discovered. Why their culture didn't re-emerge and flourish at the new site is still not clear, and researchers are now looking for any more evidence that explains what happened to this once powerful civilization. The Mitanni Kingdom Mitanni was a Hurrian-speaking state that thrived between the 16th and 13th century BC around the Tigris-Euphrates river basin, and what is now northern Iraq, Syria, and southeastern Turkey. The Mitanni became incredibly powerful, perhaps even to the same level as ancient Egypt and Babylonia. At its peak, the civilization reached as far as the Mediterranean coast to the west, and Mesopotamia to the southeast. It's thought that the decline of the old Babylonian Empire gave the opportunity to the Mitanni Kingdom to expand so much, and they soon found themselves in regular conflict with the Egyptians, who coveted some of the same lands. Eventually, the Mitanni and Egyptians formed an alliance, but this soon fell apart. With Egyptian support for one candidate for king, Mitanni entered a period of infighting, which weakened them so much that they were overrun by the Assyrians. The Assyrians went on to destroy vast swaths of records and cultural objects of the Mitanni, and it's only because of their mention in Egyptian texts and the occasional artifact that we know they ever existed. Tuana 
Tuwana was a powerful Iron Age city-state that rose to prominence during the 8th and 9th centuries BC, but they were virtually eradicated from history until the remains of their capital city were found in Cappadocia, Turkey. Tuwana emerged from the collapse of the Hittite Empire and took advantage of the power vacuum that was left behind. Controlling a vital route to the Mediterranean known as the Cilician Gates, they controlled trade between the Phrygian and Assyrian empires, which enabled them to accumulate huge wealth and allowed them to quickly develop in cultural and political ways. It's not clear exactly when Tuwana fell as there are no records, but it seems to have been around the same time as when the Sumerians invaded the Phrygian kingdom and the kingdom of Urartu to the east. Hundreds of years later, it re-emerged as a Greek city and then a part of the Roman Empire. Excavations on the site today are particularly interesting because while there's still evidence of the original civilization that once lived there, there are artifacts of all of the others since. There are remains of a Roman aqueduct and Greek structures, which makes this an incredibly valuable archaeological site. Thanks for watching! I wish I had learned more about these civilizations in history class, don't you? Remember to subscribe and I'll see you next time! Bye!